The straddle planche is an extremely hard move, gymnastic moves that comes from another sport where you get conditioned for 16 years before you start training it and you expect to learn it in two years. It just doesn't work like that for most people. Yo Gorillas, welcome to the Athlete Insider Podcast by Gore Nation. My name is Phil and today's guest is one of the most successful statics coaches in Europe right now and somebody who has a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, scientific knowledge. And I'm really looking forward to the interview with you, Dennis. We received a lot of interesting questions from the community. And so uh, we will now go into the questions, uh, go into some static details. And uh, yeah, happy that you are here. Very happy, happy and honored too. Thank you for having me here, Phil. So um, yeah, the the quality of the questions that came in are like really really high quality, and I'm I'm really looking forward to jump into these. But before, how are you? Is everything fine? Uh, where are you right now? So yeah, I'm doing well. Everything's very good. Um, right now, I'm in Vienna, where I live. I'm actually Italian, but uh, the last 10 years, because of my studies, I've been living here, and I think I'll be staying here for a while. Wow. That's cool. So 10 years you're uh, in Vienna. I thought you spent your whole uh, life already in, in, in uh, Austria. No, no. I'm actually from uh, South Tyrol. Uh, so Italy, uh, Northern Italy. Uh, was born there, uh, went to school there. Uh, my family is actually Italian, but my mom, mom uh, spoke German too. So she taught me German. And since I went to German school, then I decided to move to Vienna for my uh, pharmacy studies. Uh, which I completed one or two years ago. I don't even remember. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. So, um, yeah, maybe you want to present yourself a little bit. I guess uh, some of the the people who are following following um, the static scene might know you, might uh, know mm -hmm. um, where what, what you co-founded, but maybe you can explain more. Who are you? What do you do? Okay. Yeah, well, my name is uh, Dennis. I am 29 years old. As said before, I'm actually originally from Italy, live in Vienna. Uh, I have a master's degree in pharmaceutical studies. I've been uh, doing calisthenics for almost 10 years now, so quite a while. And I've been coaching calisthenics for four to five years. Um, in the beginning, just by giving workshops all around Germany and Austria, uh, together with Achim Gullis, mostly. Uh, judging some competitions um, like World of Bar Heroes and some little ones, and then uh, moved on to online coaching mostly. And uh, a few years ago, I co-founded Stenix uh, with my coach, Leo, who um, founded the first or one co-founded one of the first calisthenics uh, gyms in Italy, actually, Calisthenics Milano. And we've been uh, coaching Uh, a lot and a lot of uh, clients since then uh, from all levels. We had pro athletes that you might know, like Manuel Caruso or Alessandro Conti or Lucian Stanut, as well as intermediate and some beginners. Uh, so a bit of everything. Yeah, it's super interesting. Like uh, I often, I saw, I once had the situation that um, I think I asked my community on Instagram uh, about some advice of my straddle planche. I think it was, and uh, mm -hmm. I received a voice message from you, which was packed with uh, so much content and with uh, so much value. Which I like. I, I think I listened to the voice messages three or four times, so I had to. <laughs> I was able to uh, get all the the value from it and the information. So um, yeah. I'm just um, happy that today you take the time to uh, reply to some of the questions and to go into detail um, about yeah, statics trainings. Um, before, I would uh, be interested in how did you get in, uh, in touch with calisthenics, I, uh, with uh, calisthenics, but also with uh, statics. I, I wrote down mm -hmm. uh, why are you so in love with, uh, with aesthetics and uh, tell us the last story. How, how did it begin? So it uh, started off when I was uh, 20 years old. Um, I've lived uh, in Vienna for like I've had uh, had been living in Vienna for one year and I was an extremely skinny guy like I almost <laughs> didn't exist I was like 48 kg like I weighed less than wow. 50 kg yeah uh, super skinny um, and used to game a lot and drink and party a lot mm -hmm. and um, I lived uh, in a student home and we had a little gym there And with a friend, we made a bet and said, yo, uh, 
we were gonna start training and just just as a fun bet to look like models one day something something stupid like that it wasn't really the idea behind it but um so we started training and i didn't like moving weights uh from a to b i wanted to do something with my body i always i was I did a lot of sport when I was a kid, I liked climbing. I always was on the move and did lots of different sports, uh, was always quite good at them too. And I wanted to do something with my body. And I looked online and found uh, calisthenics. Like I saw uh, Bar Brothers, Hannibal for King, Frank Medrano, those classics from 10 years ago. And I said, dude, I want to do that. So I started doing push-ups, dips, everything in my student home um, and stayed away from the weights because I was scared of them. And then I uh, found out that in Italy, the scene was actually pretty big already back then, even 10 years ago. And there were some good tutorials online, good for, for the standards um, back then. And well, I started looking at those, trying out a few things and just started training statics always on my own. And in Austria, the sport was like non-existent back then. And I started going to the parks to train sometimes, met some people uh, like Achim, uh, I think in the second year of training. And he was one of the first in Austria to do this too. And we started training together sometimes and just so um, started out like that. Uh, it was uh, it was this slow process and I always liked statics. I liked um, that with, if you build up the strength you can hold something which you couldn't do before. And I was always like a scaredy cat. And so dynamics didn't really interest me. You didn't even really have a possibility to train them here because back then there weren't many parks. The scene always uh, only evolved uh, time after. And uh, I always trained at home in my own room so I couldn't uh, do flips and jumps and, and things like that. Even though I always found them pretty cool, uh, I found more love for the statics and the, the progress you have to put in there, the, the meth methodology that you need to get better uh, in strength training general. But that's something that evolved with time then. Yeah. Yeah, because you and Achim, it's also like uh, some kind of, uh, I don't know, love story uh, like you two. He's, <laughs> he's, he's also not the, the dynamics guy. Uh, you two yeah. are like really strong in, in statics, but also in, in uh, weights, like in weighted calisthenics. So um, yeah, this uh, was always impressive to see you at the FIBO, etc. Um, doing your, your uh, combos. And so, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. One question that people always have is um, for how long did you only train basics? So, because I guess you didn't start with your, uh, I don't know, with mm -hmm. the uh, straddle planche or tuck planche even. For almost two years uh, since I was uh, so skinny. And since the first videos I watched were the Bar Brothers back then, I knew that a lot of basics are very important. And I think that's something that was like intuitive back then because you saw these people and they just were big and had these huge muscles and were training a lot of basics um, that I really invested a lot of time in that before I even thought about skills. Now that there's the tendency that the first thing you see is people doing skills and the first thing you want to do is skills. And so for almost a year, I actually built up some muscle before I started doing these movements. And I gained over 10 kg in the first two years uh, before before even thinking about front lever, planche, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah but you also changed your nutrition uh, drastically, I guess. I did. Uh, I, I started eating a, eating a lot. Um, actually before I got into programming and everything, uh, in that sense, my main interest was nutrition before, uh, since with my ph pharmaceutical studies, I had some lectures there and I just found them interesting. And first of all, um, took care of that, learned everything about that, went through a few phases where I get, got to know a few extremes and you like understood what's wrong and what's not for me too. I think everyone in the fitness industry goes through a phase where they do something stupid, especially in nutrition wise and then training wise too. And then you just find the, the right way to get out and, uh, and, um, and find a good balance uh, that works for you. Yeah. Because I'm always interested in this uh, transformation from a uh, skinny guy to somebody who is muscular. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, uh, yeah, you can show the, the arms. So <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but uh, like I'm, I'm always interested in this. How did this transformation uh, go? Like, uh, what are your learnings now? If if I ask you as a as a skinny guy, um, Dennis, how do I gain uh, uh, like weight? Uh, what would be your learnings from back then? Um, from back back then, I mean, the general idea is I thought I I was eating a lot. I needed to eat much more. That's point one. Many people think they eat a lot, uh, but often, especially if you're skinny, you probably move a lot. You move a lot without noticing. Like for example, when I talk, I use my hands a lot and that's my, is because I'm Italian, but just generally uh, I, I'm always on the move and um, therefore you need more. And tracking to get to know and understand what you're eating just to like take a day eat whatever you want, like how you usually eat. And that, and at the end of the day, you sit down and you maybe weigh the things before you eat them, but you just use the portion that you usually do. You put them into an app. So you get an idea how many macros you eat of this, how many macros you eat of that, et cetera, et cetera. You follow some standard rules, five times a day you eat veggies uh, and, and fruit, uh, drink enough water, uh, have enough protein, et cetera, et cetera. See if what you eat kind of falls into those standards. And then you you will see that you probably don't eat as much as you think. And then you can upper that by 200 calories, knowing kind of getting a feeling how many 200 calories are, and then adding up other 200 if it doesn't work and just give yourself and your body time to adapt um, and uh, slowly push through it. But it wasn't easy, especially when I started, like I remember of course, I didn't do it the right way, but I, I went quite extreme and I just ate so much until I almost felt sick often because I just wasn't used to eating this much. I started eating a big breakfast and that made it for me. Like that changed a lot. I, I always ate a little breakfast, especially as an Italian. We don't eat a lot for breakfast and changing that up, eating oats and consuming like 800 calories uh, for, for breakfast. And while eating the same things during the day makes a huge difference. Uh, so those are the tips. Stay consistent, eat healthy, but do not get into the extreme like you only eat clean or stuff like that. Just eat normally. You need to gain weight. Uh, eating calorie dense food will help you to get gain weight. And often if I have clients that have a very, very hard time gaining weight, I tell them, dude, eat a Ben and Jerry's at, uh, in the evening after dinner. And you'll see the weight is going to go up with time. Okay, ben so and Jerry's that's... and Pringles is the solution for everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So this is the the cheat code. If nothing helps, um, this is uh, like you as a coach. You say that this is okay to do to do it. Like Absolutely. This. I mean, calorie is calorie. If you're you're too skinny, like you need you need to get them in. And if you eat only food that isn't calorie dense, you need to eat a lot of it. And just your your stomach isn't that big and not used to expand that much and you want you don't want to that to happen either so yeah absolutely interesting cool so um from your first basics workout from starting to work out uh, becoming a model um uh, uh to which never first. happened <laughs> <laughs> yet um to the the first straddle planche uh, how much time uh, did uh, was between these two events okay so um, uh time frames always the thing with calisthenics like everyone wants to know how long it takes here and there um i can say like if i take myself as an example i was always extremely um gifted in pulling like I managed to learn a one-arm pull-up in almost no time. It always was a natural movement for me. I could do seven to 10 in a very short, short time, which is extremely rare uh, in in the scene generally. Like someone who does 10 quite beautiful one-arm pull-ups isn't, you don't find him often. And it's not something many people can reach. And that was just because I had good genetics and I, I was little, I have uh, good muscle attachments and I just always liked climbing trees when I was a kid. And those, thing, uh, those things change a lot over the time, um, like change a lot on how, how quickly you can learn something. The planche, straight arm movements were never my thing. Uh, so I always had a hard time uh, even though like the, the planche got me famous in Austria because I was probably the first person to 
to achieve it here, um, it was never my thing. I just had the luck that I started very early and I made many mistakes. So I think I started after my second year of training when I, when I did a lot of basics, I started doing a tiny bit of tuck planches, planche leans, things like that since I knew some methods from Italy and I didn't want to just go in with tries. Um, I actually reached up straddle planche uh, probably after one year after that in my third or fourth year of training, but it was bent arm. My hips were completely piked um, and it wasn't a pretty uh, planche. Uh, I think uh, when, when we met actually 2017, um, I could hold that planche for around 12 seconds or something like that. Um, and there I actually, at, the, at that FIBO, I actually met Leo who co-founded, uh, Calisthenics Milano and Stanix with me later. Um, and who was the coach of Manuel Caruso back at the day, uh, back in the time. And we talked for the whole stay there. And then I asked him to, to come judge the Austrian championships, and after that, I asked him to, to become my coach. Just I knew he, he knew a lot of things that I didn't, and he had a lot of experience. And he started coaching me. And only after three months then, uh, because I had so much strength already, I achieved a full planche. So in total, it was almost a five-year journey uh, with some setbacks um, to really achieve it. But if I would have worked with Method earlier, it would have worked way faster. And still, I always had a few problems, especially by extending my arms completely because my bicep is so short and always has the tendency to pull it and um, always had a hard time with that. So that's kind of the time frame that took, took me to learn it. Yeah. And technique made a huge difference. Super interesting. Like, uh, the, the, um, the input from a coach, the, the impact that, that he makes on, on your uh, workout is like really uh, impressive. Um, yeah. Because it really, it, 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 when you tell the story, it sounds like a cheat code. Uh, like it, yeah. it sounds that uh, Leo uh, was inserted the code and uh, bam, you got the, the full planche. So. I mean, it was, uh, it was quite crazy. And therefore, I got, I got so interested in it. And I started studying programming like a madman. I started before because I was injured. I had an impingement because I was training badly, way too much, way too often with a frequency, just by trying a lot. And I started reading about programming and then started working together with Leo. And I had already such a good base uh, that it worked so quickly. But I was very light my legs were inexistent and it was already quite strong. Uh, that's why it worked so quickly. And that is not, that's like an exception. It's not the rule. And I had already been training for four or five, almost, almost five years already, I think at that point. So I had some time on my back. It wasn't like, bam, you get a coach three months later, you fly. No, it's, it's just not like that. And the way, the aggressive way of coaching we had back then, uh, we don't have any more right now. It was way more straightforward. And now we are way slower, more careful, uh, build it up with more time just because uh, we learned a lot uh, from back then too. Like, especially with working with more and more people, you notice some trends, which you always notice after working with hundreds and hundreds of people over a long period of time and not just three months here and there. Mm -hmm. So coming to your um, experience as a coach right now, uh, what are the, the main goals that uh, your, your coach, coaches, your, the athletes are coming to, uh, to, to you for coaching? Which are the, what are the, the, the goals? Um, most of the athletes we, uh, we have have been actually training for quite a few years. So I think in average between three and five years, uh, some more, some less. Um, I like them to have trained for a while too, to have tried out things, to have already a feeling for the body, uh, especially because it's online coaching. And if you give clues, the, the people need to understand them. Um, they need to try to give objective ratings. And of course, you can learn everything over, over the time. 
uh, by trying, but uh, it's not so intuitive for everyone from the beginning. Um, and usually um, they come because they were injured for a long time. Many, many people with injuries. So we have a third person on our team too, who is a physiotherapist and really knows his stuff and those things uh, because you find so many injuries in the sport, sadly. Um, and most of them want to learn handstand, handstand push-ups, planche, front lever, one on pull-up and weighted stuff. Uh, many have this idea, uh, which I like of the complete athlete who can do everything, who can squat too, uh, who, who can um, move big weights. So they want to do weighted dips, weighted pull-ups. And I remember when I started off, most of my clients, they just wanted to reach skills and with time and how the sport shaped with time and the weighted scene growing and growing, everyone wants to become this, this kind of hybrid athlete that does everything. Uh, so most of them, like all the general skills from the one and pull up to the pull up to the front lever planche, hands and push up. Usually those are the, the big four or five skills they want to reach. And then you have dips, pull ups, squats, uh, things like that next to them or fancy things. Of course, we have some clients working on Maltese, on Iron Cross, on Victorian, uh, things like that. But uh, those aren't the, the general rule. Interesting. Um, what do you think is the main motivation to learn aesthetics? Is it uh, to impress uh, the people or is it to build muscle? Because we also received some press girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, honestly, what do you think is the, the or do you see any similarity between your mm. countries? I think the, the thing I see the most is um, the, the story I, I always ask when I'm on the phone. The first question I ask is, Like, how did you get into calisthenics just as you did? And they tell me their story. And nine out of 10 people tell the story that they started off in a fitness center uh, when they were 17, 18, 20, something like that. They, they liked it. They did bodybuilding for a few years. They maybe saw some progress. They maybe didn't. Uh, they found it boring because it didn't give them any bigger goals. And then they found this sport where the bigger goal was achieving something with their body, doing impressive stuff like hands and push-ups, holding this incredible form, the planche or, or the front lever. And this fascination, fa uh, fascination of being able to get so strong that you can hold something that you couldn't before uh, just with, with the pure strength of your muscle and having this control over the body is what leads people to do this. What people forget when they want to do this is how long it takes and how frustrating learning a skill is. Um, and I think that is, that is the second big, uh, big thing that happens. Um, many people get discouraged with time because uh, it like just to make a little step to learn the planche can take months and year or years for some people. And you always see on Instagram, the people that have uh, absolute God genetics and there's, They're not a lot. Like when you scroll through Instagram, of course, you see the people who are successful, but you don't see the 99% who doesn't make it to get there. And those are the people who then ask for coaching because just by trying, they don't get better and they don't manage to achieve those things that they want to. Um, and yeah, I think the, the motivation is, is that. And then there's always the question, if they want to keep going. And that's one of the reasons why I like working with people who already have been doing it for a few years. They know how frustrating it can get and they know how long it takes because a coach can give you a way, can give you programming and can help you for sure doing the right things, but he's no magician. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, as I said, like uh, one motivation also of the people is uh, building muscle. And uh, one question was, are statics a good way to build muscle? Okay, so um, um, let's say it, the, the, straight, the straight answer is no, it's not a good idea. Um, if, you, if you look at the, at the spectrum um, and look at the studies that are out, you have um, eccentric movements, when you do a slow negative that damage the muscle a lot, uh, therefore uh, create a lot of fatigue, make you tired, but they create the most damage, meaning the most damage it gets built the most. A concentric movement uh, is quite effective, 
quite effective too, but not as effective. Combination of the both is always the best. And isometrics are somewhere in between. The thing with isometrics, uh, and when we're talking about skills, static skills, we are holding an iso isometric movement. So the muscle is under tension, uh, but it doesn't go through the motions. Um, lay somewhere in between. And the thing is, the hypertrophy or the range where you put in the strength is about 30 degrees in there. So you will, like if you hold a planche, the shoulder will work a lot, but just to a certain range. Of course, if you do a side raise, the range will be bigger. You go from this position down here up to here where it's completely shortened and here where it's not shortened. And doing that is more effective and more safe to build muscle. So first of all, statics, can build muscle, of course. It's a tension, the muscle doesn't care if you have a weight in your hand or if you're doing a planche or not. Um, but the most effective way to build muscle is in other rep ranges uh, with other intensities and through bigger ranges of motions while creating less fatigue. And those movements are usually movements that you see in bodybuilding uh, or, I mean, or like the pull-up or things like that. But isometrics, I wouldn't use isometrics to build muscle. Of course, you will find people that have built an incredible physique by doing isometrics. They probably did some basics too. They have incredible genetics for building muscle. If they would be doing, if they would do bodybuilding, they would probably explode, be even bigger because it just is the better way to train that specific thing. Um, but uh, and they build it with isometrics too. I built quite some muscle by doing a lot of skills too, after having a good base in, uh, in, the, in basics. But generally, I wouldn't like if somebody says, I want to build muscle, I wouldn't advise that. If that is the only way to have fun in training, of course, I'll take that because um, the most important thing is being consistent over time and having fun at it and being able to stick to it. If you don't stick to it and the training is boring for you, it won't work. But I would combine both and use skills more as a neuromuscular uh, understanding movement part and doing the, the muscular part somewhere else more than using the isometric to build muscle. It will happen for sure. You have some extreme positions in the planche your bra brachogradialis is extremely extended and you put a lot of tension under there. And when a muscle is completely lengthened, it gets damaged a lot if you put weight on it. So it will grow. That's why planches have ginormous biceps, even if they never curled in their whole life. Same for me. I had quite a good bicep, but when I started curling, my arm doubled in no time. So you see, you see the, the, the general line is that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I, when you talk, I have to think about uh, Filippo uh, Picci, mm -hmm. uh, like mm -hmm. uh, because he's like uh, also known for his statics. He also does weighted, but um, it would be interesting to know about his training. I don't know if you have any insights, but like he's really big, and I always think yeah. if he would be a bodybuilder, he would he would blow up. Absolutely, I think Filippo uh, Filippo. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not 100 sure. Had a history of training, like he started quite early uh, with uh, with weight training and gymnastics, and he just had an incredible potential to to build muscle. And skills are enough to maintain it or make it better. But he pulls crazy weights. He dips crazy weights. He does absolutely absurd volumes of training. Like if you see what he does, it's like out of this world, like most humans would just feel like crap for the whole week after working like that and having a constant work volume that is so high. Um, and yeah, you always find people like that, but um, that's it. And they're, they're not the norm. There aren't many Filippo Filipp Peaches out there. Sure. Yeah. And that's uh, one danger of social media because you see a lot of Filippo Pichis out there. Like it can yeah. seem like this. Um, but, exactly. Uh, yeah.
Okay. Um, one thing that uh, was interesting for me, you're always uh, like also showing, showing and sharing your uh, weighted um, trainings. You're also mm -hmm. uh, pulling extreme numbers. Um, you're dipping heavy. Um, so um, yeah, tell us more about the relation between weighted and statics for you. Why do they go together so well for you? Uh, why do you do both? Um, do you think that weighted is slowing down your statics progress uh, or do you think it, it even supports each other? It would be mm -hmm. interesting. Okay. So uh, the answer to that is, I think, a tiny bit more complex. Um, generally, there are many skills that gain a lot from weighted training. Um, especially the main mover always is uh, the muscle. So you can imagine the muscle as a big glass. Um, the bigger the glass, the more water you can fill in. So the muscle is the glass. And then you, if you do a lot of weight and you build up a lot of muscle, you will have a big glass. If you fill it up with water, which is high intensities, or in if we train skills, very specific training towards the skill, I will be able, the bigger my glasses, the better the skills will be until a certain extent. Of course, with skills, there's always the thing, there's specific muscles that help a lot and there's always muscles that don't do anything for that movement. Therefore, if, um, if I uh, hold a front lever, but I have ginormous legs, the muscles there won't help me. They will just make it harder. Uh, if I have a ginormous chest, won't help me in a front lever. Uh, if I have a ginormous lat, yes, it will help me. If my, my lat is completely enormous, it will probably not help me that much at the end of the day. There's, there's a stop to that spectrum. Um, there are skills that gain a lot out of weighted training uh, because they're very similar from the movement pattern and extremely specific. Every client that comes to me and wants to learn the one-arm pull-up I let them do pull-ups, weighted pull-ups. The easiest way to progress um, in no matter what is by working with numbers and numbers are objective. They don't care like what you do. If the form is right and the numbers go up and you just get stronger, it's very easy to see. When you work with one of pull-up variations like the archer pull-up, you have so many things you can compensate to make it easier. And therefore, progressive overload is way more difficult because the pe person can just be cheating more and more. And it's easier to spot the cheat when they put on more weight. Um, therefore, working with weighted pull-ups to learn a one on pull-up is the best idea you can have. Uh, you can work slowly. You can work progressively over time. You can just get stronger to a certain point where you say, okay, he's moving very well. He's using his muscles well. He is pulling himself up very uh, in a very good pattern. Uh, and then you start specific work for the one-arm pull-up and you keep that volume very low just to understand the movement, understand how with one arm you can activate your scapula, pull your, your elbows well towards the body, et cetera, et cetera, without stressing the, the tendons too much and other little structures that you would if you would just be doing that uh, and already having a good base and doing most of the volume on weighted training. So there are things that gain a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, from weighted training. There are things that do less. Uh, the dip, for example, is good to give general strength and have good strong shoulders and good strong triceps. But if you take like many people think that the dip is a must to learn the planche, it's not. Um, it can be helpful, of course, but the let's say the exercise a hand uh, a planche gets most out of is actually the handstand push up because just because of angle specificity and the muscles that get used in the handstand push up are way more important for for the planche uh, and we have many clients that when doing dips um, they are not interested in dips they don't like dips they had bad uh, injuries with dips in the past. There are much better exercises you can do instead of the dip. Uh, you can work more on handstand push-ups. You can work more on push-ups, stay safe, build up muscle anyway, and do the specific work on the planche. Um, I think for me, it's always been about changing things up. Uh, when you've been training for 10 years, um, things get repetitive, uh, like training, especially uh, 
when you when you work with plants, um, it gets repetitive. You do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And I've reached what I wanted in skills. Um, I did get injured a few times over my career. And I just wanted to change things up and do something a bit different. I wanted to be better in things where I wasn't good at, um, just as a challenge for myself and to keep myself interested into the sport. So really went a weighted way. I started training legs. I um, I wanted to get my one ram up. I wanted, since I always sucked in dips, I never liked doing dips. I wanted to get better in that. And so I just kept my skills very, very uh, like on the side, just maintained them a tiny bit, uh, put on other 10 kg, especially on my legs, uh, lost a lot of skills that way because I just was motivated to put enough effort in them um, to really maintain them, just doing them kind of, and then stopping doing them because I had other interests and I just wanted to do something else for a bit of time. And now I'm, for example, cutting, training mostly in a bodybuilding style, and regaining some of the skills that that I lost over that time, which happens very quickly after you've learned them once, which is uh, super nice too uh, at the same time. So for me, it's always been a bit um, before I was, um, I I saw myself and I, I identified myself as an athlete mostly. Uh, so I had this pressure to be better, be the best, always push. And um, when I started coaching more and more, and especially when I saw how some people learn things extremely quickly because they're just good at it naturally. And some people need to struggle two years to understand one single activation, um, how like I knew that I wouldn't have a chance in certain things against other people. Or like if I didn't put 20 years of work into it, then I could have made it. And just the risk of injuring myself, especially because of some things I already had or structures that I built uh, a certain way uh, in me, I knew I need to put that dream aside and I have other things that are fun and that I like where I'm extremely good at, dude, I want to get my 80 kg pull up. And I went and, and I got it, you know, things like that. It just, um, I identified myself more as a coach, which put a, off a lot of weight as me of an athlete. And I saw training less stressful and more as a fun thing to get my mind off things, how it used to be uh, in the beginning, uh, especially because the few last years were extremely uh, stressful between finishing university and building up the business and stuff like that. So it always depends on, on shifting goals and uh, everyone, like I'm always of the idea, anyone can do whatever they want and what they like. Um, but what I like at the same time is sticking to it. Like if I take a decision, I do it for one or two years. So I really get the most out of it. If I change every month, I won't get anywhere. That's, that's true. So focus um, is uh, like really important, especially with uh, all the static moves. Like uh, if we come back to the topic of statics, with all mm -hmm. the static moves you could learn, uh, there are like, I don't know, 20 to 50 things that are really attractive um, and that I would like to do. But um, how many skills at the same time in your experience makes sense to, to train for? Is it one or is it three or what is it? Um, I would say most of our clients work, um, on six to eight skills or things at the same time in, in average, uh, which doesn't mean that there's weird, fancy stuff in there. Like, uh, but you have the pull up, you have to dip and the squat, um, the muscle up, and then you learn planche front lever and one on pull up. Depending, like if you do pull-ups, you're already trained for the one on pull-up, honestly. And if you're a bit more advanced, you will have some technical work in it. And if you're extremely advanced, you will have direct work on it and maybe less on uh, weighted pull-ups. But I think that most people, they, they think they, they can do only one thing or two things at the same time. If you program it smart, if you think about it more uh, in a way of what muscles are used for this and that and just do a tiny bit of technical work, which is more than enough, usually many, like everyone um, does way too much most of the time. Often you just need to learn certain activations, certain movements, do the way, uh, do the work in a safe manner. Um, you stay free from injuries, you get stronger and you learn the things, maybe slower, but in a more safe way. And then you're able to work at 
four to six things, even 10 things at the same time. No problem. Of course, after a certain point, um, progress will be slower, uh, especially if you take legs into account. Uh, it's just part of it. Will take a tiny bit longer. Uh, it's physics, but and it's fatiguing. Uh, but if you do it smart, you you have phases where you concentrate on one thing and then the other. You you can do everything. Uh, I wouldn't exaggerate it. I think like over eight, it becomes kind of difficult throwing things together. Uh, regeneration wise um, and just uh, time wise. Yeah. Interesting. Something that I see a lot, and uh, also uh, two or three people asked in the uh, in the Instagram uh, question question box, was um, that they are stuck with a straddle planche, for example, to two uh, at two to three seconds, uh, something between one and three seconds, I would say. Mm -hmm. And um, how can they now um, make the static hold longer? So um, do they practice the the tuck planche and go to uh, there and uh, maximize the hold there? Or what is the, the next step if you're stuck at uh, one to three seconds of your uh, of your static hold? Okay. So I will take into account that the static hold they have, the two to three seconds they have, they're extremely clean, uh, that they, they have all the activations in the right places. Otherwise, like, it's like take three steps back and start from the beginning kind of story who nobody wants to hear. <laughs> um, so they, they hold the straddle planche for two to three seconds. Let's say when somebody has two to three seconds in training, it would be nice before they really start integrating it, uh, that they actually, if they directly want to train that movement, uh, have five seconds of hold uh, in that movement so that you work with a certain buffer, uh, that you have this three seconds in reserve, that you can really focus on the movement and that you can get better and you have a margin. It's like bench pressing 100 kg, Uh, when 100 kg is your max and you every training you go in, you bench press 100 kg. Everyone, even if you don't have a lot of experience in training, would think, okay, maybe it's better I do 90 uh, for three reps and then I do 92.5 for three reps the next week, et cetera, et cetera, and get better. And then I probably won't be uh, benching 100 for a while, but the next time I try, I will bench 110. Same principle, uh, just very simplified. Um so they probably can hold it five seconds, meaning they can do a few sets of direct work. Two to three, maybe four sets of direct work. Uh, what they can do, if it's extremely solid, they can add set week, week by week. Meaning if the second week you hold for three seconds, the third week, if they're extremely solid in it, probably have already seven to eight seconds of hold. The next week they can do four sets with three seconds, then five sets of three seconds, six sets of three seconds, then seven or eight, then deload, and then start off maybe with one second more and three sets again. Just super linear, super easy. If they have a talent in it, usually it doesn't work this uh, beautifully and nice and linear. Um, the second thing they can do is as a back off, having the progression before, meaning you have a quite easy back off, like you have your four times three seconds straddle planche. And as the next exercise, you use the advanced tuck planche to gather volume. And you maybe just have two sets where you hold until three seconds. You have three seconds in reserve somewhere there. So a quality hold where you don't go all out, um, And you hold about 10 to 12 seconds, meaning you have enough specific work to uh, maintain the skill, to get better at the same time without making yourself too tired, without throwing yourself out the window by trying and trying and trying straddle planches, without having a risk of injuring yourself, putting yourself constantly in a position that you can't really hold for a long time. And we have extreme strain on certain structures. Um, and then... If your your three sec you can't get better in the straddle planche, it always stays there. You will work on um, improving the volume on the advanced tuck planche. And the third thing, which is the most fancy thing, if you really see that you have a certain thing that doesn't that isn't right uh, in your movement, that you need a certain activation uh, that is missing, you can 
uh, add assistance work for that. For example, you have problems to depress the scapula in the right way, or maybe you exaggerate it and you need to find a nice position where you work well. Usually I like to do this work directly just by giving feedbacks. But if somebody really has a very hard time, you can put some extra work, but this is very fancy and needs to happen after months and months that you see that it doesn't work and the person doesn't have the right activations and need isolated work for it. Um, and maybe he's really missing some muscle and then we need to take our time to build up stronger shoulders, come back after six months of really building up stronger shoulders, but still maintaining the movement and then going at it again. So these are the ways to get better. And a lot, a lot, a lot of patients never forget that straddle plunge is an extremely hard move, that it's uh, world level gymnastic moves that comes from another sport where you get conditioned for 16 years before you start training it, 12 to 16 years before you start training it, and you expect to learn it in two years. Um, it just doesn't work like that for most people. Wow. Oh. That's uh, really important because, um, yeah, I always say it in every podcast episode, but it's really important for me because I really mm -hmm. feel that uh, this is the the difficulty with uh, social media that you tend to uh, have the, the impression that everybody uh, learns straddle planche, especially in Italy where everybody's born with a straddle planche. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. That's it's crazy. crazy. It's important that's, that you say it. Yeah. Um, yeah. High frequency, low volume versus low frequency, high volume. Uh, specific question, but uh, there are like different training approaches and somebody was asking uh, about your opinion uh, on, on like uh, the volume and frequency mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, we'll start off with high frequency. Um, generally for a long time, especially in Germany, I think there, there has been this um, this idea of greasing the groove and uh, trying um, uh, uh, like going into the front lever every day I don't know how many times extremely high frequency the idea behind it that is that you do it in extremely low intensity so you don't get hurt that's what most people forget and they just throw themselves into a full front lever even if they can't hold an advanced tuck but that's another story um, so There's a big idea. The more you do it, the better it is. Like, well, the more I do it, the better it is. From experience, I can tell that most people um, can get better in a safe manner when they train. Let's take the planche because everyone wants to learn the planche twice a week, just twice a week. You do other work uh, on the shoulders, uh, maybe in total three times a week on that day and maybe on another day, something else. In calisthenics, since many movements are full body movements, you will have some of the muscles here and there always. Um, but rarely uh, people gain something from doing it three times a week or four times a week. If you have an extremely uh, advanced athlete, if you work with extremely um, low intensity, you can... Uh, you can do it more often, but as a standard rule, start two times. And if you tried everything else out, you can play around with frequency, but frequency, it's not something I like to play around with a lot because it's very, very risky. It's very easy to throw somebody completely off by, by doing it once more a week. Um, and usually it's enough. And then we can talk about volume as a second thing. Um, so generally, in periodization and nothing changes for calisthenics. Uh, calisthenics is a strength sport. Uh, many people think it's uh, this uh, special snowflake that uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't apply where no rule applies uh, that applies in every other sport in the world. And uh, generally, the standard rule of periodization is you start with a higher volume, which makes absolutely sense. Uh, especially if you if you work on skills, um, I can give some numbers as an example because uh, that's what I always wanted to hear uh, or I used to. Uh, so we take somebody uh, can hold a tuck planche for let's say seven to eight seconds, but the activations aren't great. Um, so what do I do now? Mm, his biggest problems 
isn't the whole time. He can, he's already quite strong because eight second stuck lunch is quite good, but he doesn't understand how to get into, into the movement. Uh, here, working with very high volume is a great idea. He can do 10 sets, which sounds crazy, but you can do 10 sets of two seconds, meaning every, the first five to six sets probably have five seconds in reserve. Uh, they're super easy for him. And then only it starts to, to really train and drain the muscle. But before he can only focus on his activations. Um, and working with high volumes um, like that, generally, in the beginning, even like if you do pull-ups, you maybe start out with uh, six reps on one day, four reps on the other day. And the months to come, you go down with the reps, you go up with the weight, and you go up with the intensity. With the skills, you kind of do the same thing, um, just way more soft. Like it's not as abrupt because everyone, the, the progress in, in skills is way less linear because many people need to understand activations before they, they can get better in the movement. And that can take a while and they need to stick to more sets for, for a longer time to understand the movement faster. Um, and generally, if you, if you take the example that I said before, you maybe start with 10, uh, eight sets, let's say you work up to 10 to 12 sets at the end of the cycle. You see at the end, hey, he has understood the activations, easy peasy, everything's easy. You can probably uh, put on one second to every set and he has no problem doing that. The next month you can start with less sets, more seconds, um, or even if everything's going extremely well, test out the tuck planche, see how he holds it. Maybe he has already understood the activations for the advanced tuck planche and start with that with a normal volume, which is four sets twice a week, eight sets in total, where you put up the sets over the weeks and you end up with uh, somewhere between uh, 16 and 20 sets at the end of, of the month. Um, so I wouldn't use a high volume method or a low intensity, uh, low volume, high intensity method, but I would, I would do it so, just as the metaphor that I used before, big glass, lots of volume, and then you start filling up this glass with high intensity, but the volume gets lower because if you do 10 sets of 10 seconds where you can only hold 10 seconds for one time, you're just gonna hurt yourself. Um, but you will end up with three sets of three seconds of advanced duck planche at the end of that. So it's a continuum. Uh, and then you just keep replaying this, uh, this uh, wave kind of. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you say something about <coughs> the rest between the sets? Because this was also a common question. How much uh, rest should I make between static sets? Mm -hmm. um, depends a lot on the intensity of the set. Generally, I give a standard rest time of two minutes plus. So after two minutes, you can you can go and see how you feel and go again. Um, there are methods, for example, when we work with 10 sets and the person just needs to understand the technique, but is very good at it, where we keep the, the rest times lower, 30 seconds, one minute, because the repetition is important. Like keep going in, going in, going in, understanding it. Um, but generally, um, most of the moves we do, uh, they they go in a max strength range, if you want to call it like that, which in powerlifting, or you usually say one to three or one to five reps, whatever. Um, so rest times should be kept quite long, two to three minutes. Uh, just so you feel fresh and you go in again. There are months and methods where you can be more fancy, when you can play around, where you can shorten your rest times to accumulate more volume, to put more stress on it, to keep repeating the movement, and then end up in months where you have longer rest times, less sets, and higher intensities by having a harder progression. Yeah. Cool. Um as you already said, everybody wants to learn the planche uh, and front lever is a little bit the, the smaller brother, I would say. Um, so yeah. uh, a question was how to combine front lever and planche because the moves are somehow different, but yeah, maybe they have some similarities, but what's, uh, what's your experience in, in someone learning, uh, wanting to learn these two um, skills? Um, I feel like planche and front lever uh, 
they go well hand in hand. You have one that is more push heavy, the planche, and one that's more pull heavy, uh, which is the front lever. In both, uh, the, the thing that connects them both is you have to understand how to use your shoulder blades, the whole scapula movement. So a lot of work for the scapula will be needed in one direction for, for, uh, for the uh, front lever in the other direction for the planche. Beautiful. You have everything there. Uh, you can use pull movements to, to um, strengthen up the front lever, uh, just like the pull up. Or if you want to be more specific, something like the bent over row. Um, and you can use um, push movements, like especially the handstand push up, maybe push ups to strengthen up the planche and put direct work in. So you can do one pull day, one push day, divide them. I generally like to put them together. It's just more fun, makes the, the training more fun and more various. Uh, you can superset them um, on certain months if you're quite advanced. I like to keep them one after another for most people. Uh, so they have planche, 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 planche and can uh, correct their mistakes between one set and the other. Uh, in an easier way later on, if they already know the activations, it has even some advantages to mix them up, have planche front lever, planche front lever, planche front lever. If you already know what you're doing for some people using the antagonist muscle um, creates a better performance um, between sets. There have been studies, but uh, generally they let, yeah, you can combine them extremely well in this way. Uh, so there's no big problem to train both. And I never had the feeling that one uh, made the other one tired or anything like that, or I, I got a better performance out of the other one because I wasn't doing one of the two. Cool. Yeah. So no, no big interference there. Okay. That's, that's good. Um, last question, uh, like really specific on, on training. Um, no, it's not the last question, but it's an, an important one. Uh, leg training. Uh, is it, um, yeah. is it a, a disadvantage? Like what is your personal motivation to, to train legs? Because I know that you are squatting heavy, heavily. Um, so uh, yeah, like what is your motivation and what do you, what would you advise someone who is asking, yeah, should I train legs? Uh, does it uh, slow down my skill performance, mm -hmm. et cetera? Okay. So when people um tell me they want to train legs in the first call i always tell them um the probability that learning skills when training legs uh will take longer is very high um it always depends on genetics um as always but if you look from a physical standpoint of view the more weight you put on the lower body um, the, the front lever and the planche mostly, if you take these two exercises, um, they're levers. And the more you put on one side, the harder it is to balance it out. So people that run around and say, yeah, I train legs and I can hold the front lever, uh, and that not training leg is just an excuse. They have not understood physics at all. Uh, if they wouldn't be training legs, their front lever would be for sure be five to 10 seconds longer. Um, that's it. Like there is no discussion about that. Um, in, in addition to that, um, a fact comes into play that leg training usually, especially if you squat, is extremely taxing on uh, neuromuscular, uh, like on a CTNS level. Um, it makes you tired. Like after a squat session, uh, you feel like shit. And especially if it was heavy and even the day after you feel lethargic. And even if you do skills the day after some people have like, uh, from I, for example, I had problems activating, uh, just because I wasn't as fresh, uh, as I used to be. That is one, uh, one other thing, a tiny bit of leg training can, um, help to understand activations but it's more activation training than going, having and building uh, muscle. Um, is it possible to do both? Absolutely. Like I'm not saying that it's not possible, but it's something you have to take into account. And like in everything, it's different for everyone. One person maybe can squat super heavy. They do not 
put that much muscle on their legs while doing so. Uh, they have an extremely high uh, muscle density. They don't look like much, but they can squat extreme weights. Um, that's just how their muscle fibers are, are made. Um, they will be able to squat extremely heavy and have no change in how they progress in, in front lever, just that the frequency of training, like they, they might be are a tiny bit more tired, but other people, they can recover extremely quickly, even if they squat heavy. So, uh, I can never tell if a person will be able to do this. Yes or no. What I can tell that probably with some less weight on, on their legs, the hold will be longer and people who manage to hold uh, very long holds um, and have trained legs. Like I can take myself, for example, I, I put on 10 kg and yes, I trained way less skills, but my front lever went from, I don't know, 25, almost 30 seconds to three seconds or something like that. Like it completely went downhill and my back though, like I managed to pull more weight. At the end of the day, I was pulling more weight. My 1RM was higher. Um, I was pulling my legs too when I was pulling up. So my back got stronger generally, but I didn't do a lot of specific training. So I wouldn't count it as, as a well-done case study. Uh, if I've done more and, and I wouldn't have put on the weight so, so, so quickly uh, without training skills at all almost, um, it would have been a completely different story. And it comes back very, very quickly after that. But um, it does make a huge difference. And I'm somebody who tends to put on muscle very quickly. Um, like even if I stay quite light at the end of the day, there, there just comes flash there and, uh, and that flash is heavy and it doesn't help me to hold my front lever. It, some like for the planche, for example, having like, heavier legs. I just couldn't feel them anymore and not activate my hips like I used to. Like it was an absolute catastrophe. And for some people, it will not be like that. And they will be able to do it anyway, or they just get so much stronger over time. They dip so much more and they move so much more weight, or they pull up so much more that generally they got, they get stronger anyway, and they put on more muscle and they can uh, equalize it that way. But yeah, the, the response is it will take longer. Um, there are smart ways to do it. Uh, like you work for six, eight months on a certain thing, you maintain a skill, then you cut, uh, you get off all the excessive fat, you maintain the, the leg training with low intensities, but still high numbers. And um, you work on improving the skills again, and then you rerun the cycle. But as you can see, this is something you have to think in years, not in months. And it's, um, it's quite a lot of work. Super interesting. Um, I definitely appreciate like um, you showing, you definitely uh, showing up the risks of uh, leg training, I would just mm -hmm. call them or the downside, but still uh, showing the way how, how it's possible because um, mm. yeah, leg training gives uh, advantages to, to the health, uh, to, to uh, long-term things yeah absolutely Aesthetics. it depends on the goal yeah. and some people just want to learn the planche and then i'll tell them that if you just want to learn the planche just learn the planche uh if that's your goal don't let social media or other people pressure you into doing something where you don't have fun and you make your, your life harder like if you like challenges okay do it but uh already be someone with decent genetics for planche if you really think about doing that because otherwise you can forget that move altogether. Um, yeah. Awesome. Two more personal questions. Um, what are the, the, your current goals that you are working on right now? Okay. Uh, Sport-wise? Sport-wise. Sport-wise. At the moment, um, I'm actually in some kind of transit phase. Uh, I, I work towards 1RMs for a long time. Um, and put skills a bit aside, um, which was um, fun, but uh, kind of burned me out towards the end. I was very happy with where I got and the numbers uh, I pulled and dipped um, and quite happy with those. Uh, with the squat, I had a little issue with my oblique, so I stopped for a long time uh, and put it on, on the side again, Now I'm mostly training bodybuilding style and really changing up the training, just going more for a muscular feel. Uh, I never trained bodybuilding wise. Many people did in the beginning 
and I'm regaining a lot of skills very quickly. Um, I'm cutting, um, getting more in my comfort zone uh, of weight where where I used to be or where where I feel just better and lighter. And want to regain a lot of skills at the moment. Uh, just feel good, have fun in training. Just not think about it when when you work towards numbers so long it's, it just drains you like it's everything you think about you go into the training it needs to work you need to be fresh it needs to be a good day etc cetera, etc cetera. you're at your complete limit all the time it makes you trash tired and at a certain point you just don't want to see them anymore and now i'm working with low weights i have my ego side i just go for feeling and it's super fun and i'm really really enjoying it so at the moment it's that after that um, my goal, long-term goal as an athlete is actually, uh, I want to find the, the perfect way, uh, the best way to just, uh, look good, have as much muscle as possible, be as lean as possible. Uh, of course that will be phases. Like it's not possible to beat all the time and have, um, be able to do as many skills as possible for as long as I can and just feel good and healthy about it. So we'll, I'm trying to find a style of training that is very safe for me, uh, that is very fun, that feels good, that allows me to grow um, mostly in the body, but um, allows me to specialize very quickly because I've done everything already. Meaning if I spend a year bulking now and mostly training um, hypertrophy wise, my maintaining some skills, I will be able after a three to six month cut being extremely lean, being bigger than I used to be. And in those months where I cut specialize again, maybe I want to do a weighted competition. I have the muscle and the foundation and the technique uh, to, um, to specialize for a weighted competitions and go and have extremely good results better. Even though if I, I didn't, touch high weights for a year to have a better performance there just because very specifically I can uh, do those movements because I know them and because I have more muscle, I want to do more skills again. I go in that direction. And uh, this is the way of training that I like that I see doing myself long-term um, and not burning out on because it allows me to go in every direction I want, be it endurance, be it statics, be it this or that. And at the same time, since uh, I'm not scared of injuries like I used to, because before uh, training was my life and I absolutely depended on it. And now I see myself more as a coach. I'm starting to trick. I want to start tricking, doing flips and stuff. Something I always wanted to do. I was scared of doing and taking that on, on me, but uh, less on the bar. So not, not freestyle. I'm not going down that route, but, uh, but flips and stuff on the floor um, for now. Oh. Cool. Yeah, keeping it fresh. That's cool. That's uh, like really important. If somebody trains for ten years, I think uh, uh, it can get boring. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. definitely feel you. Yeah. Um, we received a question about your morning routine, uh, which is something that is also uh, quite interesting. Um, do you want to <laughs> uh, to tell us more? Okay. Uh, well. Um, since I've been a student or I was a student for a long time and now I'm self-employed and I always like to study in the evenings. Uh, I like to work in the evenings. Uh, I'm not someone who gets up early. Uh, I don't like it. So I don't, I don't usually like if I have extremely stressful times, I, I, um, I do, but most of the time I get up at around 8.30 or nine, depending on how long I worked in the evening. Um, and the first thing I do is turn on my coffee machine as I picked up coffee as a hobby, uh, during the lockdown. So, uh, I've, I've always thought like, I like having interests. I always like cooking a lot and I always go very much into detail, everything I like, like I completely freak out about it. And, uh, I, I wanted to do it about a drink. I don't drink wine or, or whiskey or anything like that. And I wanted to have knowledge about something else. So uh, coffee it was, I always loved coffee and I got myself a nice coffee machine. Uh, I buy different beans and I like to make myself a very good, uh, well extract, extracted coffee, try out different ones uh, and draw in latte art. And 
then I always have my the same breakfast kind of. So the, the only meal in the day that's always the same for me is my breakfast, uh, which is oats, uh, some, uh, some berries, always different, uh, protein powder, um, banana and milk or water if I don't have milk. And now I'm, I put it in the mixer before I used to cook it, put some chocolate on it. And uh, I like to do that. Um, usually that's my general working, uh, morning routine. When it's warm, I sit out on the terrace I have, I stare into the sun and I put my phone away and I just enjoy my time there. And then um, I usually come and sit down and start working. Um, uh, or uh, often I just drink my coffee, work for four hours until 12 or so, uh, or 13 o'clock. Then I have breakfast only very, very late. And then I go training and then I have lunch at 17 o'clock and uh, dinner at 20. That's like the more typical training day. So everything's a bit shifted, but uh, yeah, that's my morning routine. If you want to call it like that, it's a, uh, it's not a typical, oh, I wake up at 5. AM and I start working. No, I, I, I like to work in the evening. Um, I like to sleep in the morning. I sleep very well there. And I like to enjoy uh, the peace in my coffee. Awesome. Wow. That's cool. So, uh, yeah, we're slowly coming to an end uh, of the episode. Um, we always have some quick questions, quick answers at the end of every mm -hmm. episode. So, um, yeah, favorite food uh, with a small addition from Iris who uh, asked, uh, accept pizza with pineapple. <laughs> um, steak. I love the uh, steak. I've uh, perfectioned the art of steak and um, I think that's my favorite food. Cool. Uh, are you a dog or a cat person? Hmm. Um, I used to have cats. I got allergic to them while I was in Vienna. Uh, I like dog as, um, as an animal and companion more, but uh, I, I like them both. I think dogs a lot of work, cats less, both are cute. So no, 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 no right answer there. <laughs> okay. Um, if you would have to choose, uh, would you choose a, a good body or a cool skills? Um, cool skills. Okay. For sure. Uh, what athletes inspire you? Hmm. This is an interesting one. Um, I think the, the athletes that like, it always depended on, on uh, where I wanted to go at the time. I think one of the most impressive athletes at the moment uh, is um, actually Baki and Zod. I think those two, especially Baki, it's just uh, just incredible what, uh, what, like how complete they are, how strong they are, how they keep improving after years and years and years and years of training. Um, just beautiful, yeah, I would, uh, would say those. True. Yeah, like Baki, when I see like his mobility, like he's uh, extremely, mm -hmm. extremely uh, like with his side splits and uh, his straddle planche, he has like legs I've never seen before. So like in so many areas, that's true. It's uh, extremely yeah. impressive. It's extremely difficult to be this good in this many areas. It's extremely rare. It's an absolute gem because many people define their, they find something where they're good at. But being so all so well rounded, uh, looking the way he does and performing the way he does is extremely rare. Um, and like just skills wise, uh, the um, there was one athlete in Italy that not many people know uh, that uh, I always I always liked much, but I I forgot his name right you now. You don't know him as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I forgot him as well. He stopped being active uh, along uh, uh, Lorenzo something. Um, Lollo, uh, he's called on Instagram, but uh, he had the clean aesthetics. He was able to do dynamics, uh, gymnastic dynamics and just um, in incredible. Uh, and Majeli, I always liked too. But uh, those, those freaks, it's... Um, It's just something different. And once you learn, like see people working extremely hard to reach certain things with way more dedication than uh, very uh, gifted athletes do, I have more appreciation for that. I have more appreciation for the hard 
work people put in um, compared to being a genetic freak who trains very unregularly, but is so gifted that he does, does get better anyway. Uh, and although they have a hard time, they keep going and keep going and keep going. So, yeah. That's true. Uh, what's your favorite skill? Um, the one I never really completely reached, the Maltese. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, pull or push? Pull. <laughs> you, already, you already said. Uh, do you have a favorite book that you want to recommend? Because uh, also we had one question that was asking, where do I get the, the knowledge about skills and biomechanics? Um, maybe you can recommend some books for the people who want to go deeper in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so good books about calisthenics don't exist yet. Uh, there is no book I would recommend where you can learn a lot from it. Overcoming gravi gravity is like decent to get an idea what skills exist, but not more, not more, and not programming wise. In Italy, there are there is one book that is or two books that are decent from Project Invictus, uh, but they're only in Italian. Um, one of our plans is to write a book like like this in the future, where you really have the basic foundations of everything in there. Um, the books I will recommend will be outside of the calisthenics world, uh, and you will have to learn to apply um, the knowledge you learn there to to the skills and find parallels, which we did. And uh, mostly, it's like the pyramids from Helms, uh, the strength uh, principles, uh, hypertrophy. Uh, how is it called? Hypertrophy and Strength Principle uh, by Mike Isretel. Um, some of the literature and video RTS, uh, Reactive Training Systems, uh, puts online. But uh, mostly, um, I would look into, it's called MASS, M-A-S-S. -S. It's a website um, by Greg Knuckles and Eric Trexler. Uh, those are big people in the general fitness community who do a lot of research. And what they do, uh, not only research themselves, um, they take studies that come out and make reviews about them. And they have built this incredible website uh, where you um, pay a monthly abonnement and they don't only review uh, all the studies that come out in the fitness world every month, but they uh, have um, some programming basics in there too. And everything they put in there is science-based and evidence-based. And it's well-made, it's beautiful, and it helps out everyone who really wants that. You need to dig into it. Uh, and it's good you have read some of those, uh, those uh, books. Uh, but if you look up Mike Rizretel and... Uh, you will find uh, some good and um, Eric Helms, you will find some good books by those two people. And then you will apply what you learned there to, um, to, to calisthenics. And that is already a good start and much more than 99.9% uh, .9 of people are doing in this sport. Cool. Also, a quick uh, cross uh, shout out. I would call it to Frink's movement. I don't. I, I guess you you know yeah. him, uh, Eric uh, from uh, from Poland, who is like uh, doing a really good job with podcasts as well. And he interviewed yeah. Mike Israel. So um, I know. I know. We will also leave the link um, and also to the links to to your books. You have to send me afterwards, uh, please. Um, so I we will. Can, I will. We can link them uh, for the people if, uh, who are interested. But as I said, like. Uh, the podcast interview with um, Mike Israel and uh, Frank's movement is really um, worth uh, listening. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. Uh, favorite music genre? Um, <laughs> I don't really have one. Uh, I, I listen to a bit of everything, uh, honestly. Usually it's something in the direction of rock. Um, it used to be epic music when I started training. Uh, which is quite special, but uh, a lot in the calisthenics uh, scene. Uh, listen to that. Yeah, those, those two probably, cool. I would say. Uh, the best calisthenics event you've ever visited? Hmm, uh, for sure, the, the FIBO uh, World of Bar Heroes. Um, the, the last one we did, what was it, 2019? 2019. Yeah. Before the world went to complete... 
<laughs> yeah, and some events in Italy, uh, but those were little ones. Like uh, those events where where you get to know so many uh, Italian athletes. Um, those are just fun, uh, just because the people are so crazy and fun. Like you, you meet people you would never think of. It's uh, <laughs> those those events were were always great. Yeah, nice, great. The last question: What's your message to the Kelosenics community? What do you want to uh, give to the listeners? Um, maybe something that you want to give them as an advice. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, it's the thing I, I repeated over and over again in the podcast. Uh, I think it's the thing we always try to put in our marketing. Um, so at Stenix, like the message we always want to try to give to people is um, that most things you see are outliners and you shouldn't feel bad about yourself when certain things don't work and they just take time. Um, that you shouldn't believe into fast, quick, uh, best way to learn something, but consistency, hard work, and working well and intelligent, like with the brain, using your head, are the best way if you want to reach certain goals. Um, never forget the fun. Uh, working with a plan doesn't mean that it's not fun, but you want to reach the goals and you just take the best way to do so. Uh, which for most people is the thing they want to reach. And this, this is what makes them happy. Um, and yeah, don't fall for stupid marketing. Don't fall for cookie cutter programs. Um, use your head, apply what you learned and learn from it. And, um, and yeah, stay real. Like everyone always searches for shortcuts, especially in the fitness world, 10 million diets, quick, 30 days, 10 days, learn this, learn that. It takes time and it's not a bad thing that it takes time. Your body needs time. The muscle are quite quick in learning things. Your ligaments aren't. And, um, and it's a journey and you should enjoy it. Yeah. Poetic. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, yeah. How can people get in touch with you? How can they learn uh, from you? Do you have open spaces for, for coaching? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, tell us a little bit. Uh, so probably the most valuable information we put out there uh, is on YouTube right now. So we have uh, started a, a YouTube channel not a long time ago uh, called Stenix, uh, S-T-H-E-N-X. Um, we're... Uh, We really try to bring this message to people, have some showing some how you learn the right technique and really taking some case studies of uh, clients of ours where we follow them for like two years. So long, a long time and show them how they progress and what we did to, to so that they reach certain goals um, on Instagram at Stenix2. So at Stenix and then underscore. Um, And on Instagram, you can find me under Dennis underscore Kalis. So these are the things where I'm mostly active. We have a podcast um, uh, on, on Spotify um, called Stanix, the Stanix podcast. And I used to be in the strengths and skills podcast where they have a lot like I'm in the first 40 or 50 or 60 episodes where you find a lot of useful information too. Uh, if you're interested in programming and training, uh, both in English and German. And I think, uh, I think uh, that's that. Yeah, coaching spots, we still have open coaching spots since uh, we have one more coach and physiotherapist working with us. Uh, we, our capacity is, uh, is, has grown and we can take in more people. Yeah. Wow, that's good news. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, if people want to reach out to you, I guess Instagram is the best way. Instagram is the best way, yeah, directly cool. on Stenix. And there you have a link tree if you want to apply to the coaching and everything. And just uh, follow me on Instagram, shoot me a message. On my personal channel, you won't find that much. It's more about just uh, me drinking coffee most of the time. <laughs> But on Stenix, uh, we post uh, very regularly every week client results and we explain what we did with them and some informative videos. So there you can learn a lot of little things uh, when you already have a base that you will understand them very well. 
which is quite untypical uh, content for Instagram because uh, you're not the the fancy edited uh, trap music uh, content, uh, but yeah. it's like uh, more like I would call it in a in, in a positive way, like a webinar style or like a lecture. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really something that is worth watching and worth uh, checking out. And I think YouTube is also really high quality. Uh, what I saw until now. So um, yeah, thank you. So. Yeah, you're doing an awesome job. I think like uh, the quality that you brought um, into into this, I still remember. Like, I think it was um, was it 2019 that you told me about this project, and you had this small Instagram page where you started posting. Or when was it? Like, I um, think it was yeah, two years ago. So we started 2019 with uh, with Stenix and just posting results. Uh, we never followed anyone. We like yeah. every social media rule that you usually follow. We, we didn't, we just said like, if somebody's interested in what we do, he genuinely needs to be interested. Otherwise he won't read our text. He won't interest himself to, to get better. Um, so we never followed anyone. We never liked anything. We never comment anything. Every follower got in there because they were interested in our comment, uh, in our content. Of course, it's not a lot, but uh, still, I think we're um, quite well known, uh, especially like in Italy, uh, Germany, in Austria, through the podcast and stuff. Most people have uh, have uh, have heard from Stanix somewhere. Still, even if the channel isn't big, even if the numbers aren't big, um, people always find a way to us some way or another. So I guess it's working. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you if you do a good job, if you have a good product, you don't need uh, the the a lot of marketing for it. Um, so mm. um, you can only focus on the quality of the product and i what i can say from here and the the, the incredible voice message uh, to uh, to uh, to close that loop uh, in the in the beginning that uh, told me uh, yeah the, the things that i have to improve like uh, the quality will will um, yeah just pull people towards uh, the the coaching mm -hmm. and you so yeah dennis thanks a lot uh, for your time um, thank, and thank uh, you mostly for for sharing so much like uh uh replying to the questions from the audience is really really nice i think like i took a lot of uh, things for myself as well so that's uh, that's also good um so yeah thanks everyone a quick uh, thank you to you uh, on the other hand on the other end listening to this uh, it's been a long episode again one and a half hours um Thanks a lot for staying with us till the end. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, if you want to support the episode, give it a thumbs up. That helps a lot. And um, yeah, Dennis, you have the last words. Thanks again for your time. And uh, you can end the episode and say goodbye to everyone. Okay. I, I want to thank you uh, for having me here. Um, amazing opportunity and like uh, super cool that you had me here. And uh, I appreciate your work too. I uh, always did. Uh, since the beginning uh, and uh, thank you to the listeners thank you to everyone and have a good one <laughs>